which it would be annoying. <laughs> Thanks, Ed, <laughs> for throwing that over to me. Welcome to um, episode six of 120 Grit. Rough enough to take the surface off without tearing it apart. Today we're here with um, our very special guest, uh, Lexi Crouch, who's a who's a fantastic friend of Trademutt. We came to meet in the uh, confines of Impact Academy in Spring Hill here in Brisbane, and Lexi turned out to be quite a bloody bubbly, rambunctious character who we, can, we became best friends with um, effortlessly. <laughs> Lexi, welcome. Welcome to the show. Hi, thanks for having me today. <laughs> you look absolutely fantastic. It's awesome to see you. Um, it's been a little while. How have you been? Good. It's been a good year, actually. Had a few chapters that I quite like, but mostly smooth into the next bit now. But yeah, how have you guys been? Yeah, we've, good. we've been good. good. We're cranking out these podcasts now and having special guests in. And um, You're one of them. I'm putting up with this half wit over here and he's putting up with me, so. Ditto. No, it's going well. It's going well. So, Lexi, let's get a bit of a background for everyone out there listening. Uh, you were born and bred Brisbaneite? I absolutely was. Where'd you go to school? I went to St. Aidan's, um, an all-girls school over towards the west side of Brisbane, but then actually ventured up the hill into Woomba um, for my final years of school there at Fairhome College. Ventured awesome. up the hill, up the range. Yeah. That's a nice drive. The boarding school experience. Quite scenic. How did you find boarding school? I, despite what I was going through at the time, the actual boarding school experience I loved. You're pretty much there with... 300 sisters running a riot without parents and basically I owe that to the person I am today was <laughs> that experience. So. How did you find the transition coming from a school late in your high, like in high school and year 10 then going into a new school year 11 and 12? How did you find that transition? I actually liked it because I'd been at my other school uh, all through primary school. So I was ready for a change and kind of stepped into that dynamic. I was going through some things at the time but Managed to um, fit in quite well. Became school prefect as well. Sure. And, um, it doesn't surprise sure, me that, that, you, that you managed to fit in well. <laughs> Resume. You, yeah. You've got a pretty adaptable personality, right? And you know, slide that one in. But no, it was <laughs> <laughs> <yeah>. You. <No. laughs> and I feel I was on the cross country team there, and I just like the Darling Down region a little bit more than Brisbane because the runs were a little bit more scenic. So there oh, wasn't yes. not too much to love there. Awesome. So when we um, when we met at Impact Academy, a social enterprise incubator startup type, you know, scenario that we're in, lots of people doing, you know, a, a bunch of different exciting things. But you um, you came in um, working for one startup, and pitching that, but that um, which was quite an interesting idea. It was, yeah, but it didn't. Um, it fell over, I, I think, basically, or. Um, and then you sort of deviated and we got to know the real Lexi Crouch. Not that we didn't get to know the real Lexi Crouch at the start, but we happened to find out about your incredibly powerful story and um, super touching. You had um, a lived experience uh, with anorexia nervosa. Um, tell us a little bit about your background and, and, and that sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I feel like that was um, a huge fundamental kind of element was coming into Impact Academy. You know when you have those periods in your life where the universe kind of steps in and really makes you do what you want? So it was quite funny, as you said, I'd stepped in and came through that very science-y startup. We had that medical uh, device that we were working with, which, yes, doing a science degree, I was very into that. But Basically, it was one of those situations through impact as well where we all were on missions, particularly a lot for humanity, and I got to share my story and I guess fell into the role to where I am today. But that all stemmed from my life experience. So a little bit about my story was um, I obviously was a girl growing up in Brisbane, as we discussed. Still are. Still am, still <laughs> <laughs> growing by the day. And um, I... I guess I started at school and just like any kid around seven years old, you don't really know too much about who you are, who you're meant to be. Um, I guess you're basically going about your life. But anyway, when I was seven, I experienced some bullying on the playground. I wasn't really aware at the time, but um, some older girls had come up to me and asked if my best friend was Jenny Craig. Now, I had no idea who Jenny Craig was and I thought these people were sort of coming over to be my friend. But something just didn't sit right with that. And Did you say this was grade seven? 
This yeah. is I, no, I was seven years old. Oh, you were so seven years three, old. Year three. Year She's three, your two. best mate, Jenny Craig. Yeah, yep. So that was also at a time where those were our figures of health. So we knew about Weight Watchers and Jenny Craig. So it was kind of that's what we knew about health. And people were asking me if I knew this woman when I was in grade three. No idea, but they were laughing at me, and that just didn't sit well. So I remember going home that day and talking to my mom and my parents, going, "Who's Jenny Craig?" And I don't remember much from being seven years old, but I do remember the look on her face of going, wow, I think my daughter has just been bullied for her weight. And this was concerning. So as I was saying, we didn't really know much about health back then. This was late 90s. And this was very much where when we were looking after our health, we were dieting and thinking that that was going to give us the best outcome. We didn't think about was that going to make us feel good? But we also wanted to prevent bullying and fitting in. So I started, I guess, a lifestyle of dieting, calorie counting, exercising. And this pretty much became my world. So when you're seven years old, you should be thinking about birthday cakes and sugar Mm, mm. and just food's food. Like you want to grow, you want to play. But food became the enemy. It was something that that's going to make me fat, no one's going to like me. And basically, it controlled my whole self-worth and my whole self-esteem. So that became a pattern that I got into. And basically, it just stemmed. So by the time I hit 14 years old, I was officially diagnosed with an eating disorder. How 14 years old? Yes, yeah, was wow. my official diagnosis. And so between the age of seven, so when that happened with the Jenny Craig thing, and 14, you, you had become like obsessed with calorie counting and, and eating, you know, healthy or, you know, all that, all that sort of stuff. Yeah, absolutely, Dan. That was pretty much my world. So when an eating disorder takes over, it is everything you're thinking about. So, so young. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So got a lot of, I guess, training or insight uh, about food and things that you shouldn't really know at that age. Yeah. How the hell would anyone, when you're seven years old, know what a calorie is? So I guess this is me and... At seven, you can't <laughs> even count regular numbers, let alone calories. People are more worried this about getting true. a Nutella a tub in their <laughs> smoko bag and like throwing out the apple and you're like, give me the apple. This is true. And I'm glad that we've had this conversation because eating disorders are complex and it could have been stemmed from bullying, but it could have been the type of person that I was. And do you know what I mean? An experience with bullying... I took it that way and I absolutely ran with researching and trying to change where someone might have not have had that experience and could have brushed it off. So did the eating disorder stem because I was a sensitive person and I delved into books and research and that is still a very much, I guess, a personality trait that I possess today. Like if I want to know something, I'll research. Go find it out. Yeah, and I will take things to the extremity if I want to make a change. So, again, that could have been a different experience, and I did go that direction. So, bullying may have just been a trigger. However, there may have been another event in my life that caused me to go down the path of anorexia as well. Mm, mm. Yeah, so that um, that, that period from yeah, when you were 7 to 14, what, what did that look like? Like, obviously, you weren't cutting food out when you were, like, the day after the, that bullying episode. So, how did it sort of transform into being diagnosed with anorexia at 14? Well, it just became really distorted with food. So I saw it as the enemy. Again, it was, as a kid, you're always going going to fall into situations where there were birthday parties or you were having ice blocks where every time I had been in that situation, I'd pick up a lolly or something and think, this is bad. This is going to make me fat. And I would, I guess, relate being fat to not being worthy or like anybody else. And for me to be bullied at that stage, yes, I did carry a little bit of puppy fat at seven years old. Who doesn't really? <laughs> Who doesn't, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And it just kind of stemmed into my mind to have that relationship, I guess, there. It's unbelievable. What did, you par- <coughs> did your parents pick up on any of these early signs that there was something, you know, changing? Definitely, but I was also a very controlled kid, so... Even growing up, like I was quite anxious and um, had always been quite structured. So it wasn't too much outside of my personality type anyway. Um, However, I guess with eating disorders, they are very functional and I kind of knew what I was doing even from a young age. So I'd still always have a smile on my face. And although I'd experienced bullying in that situation, I still had friends and things were happening um, around me. But I was always able to manage it to a point of going... That's just Lex. So I'm sure parents did understand in some regards. But as I was saying too, 
we thought that that was health. And again, it was seen as a Lex is avoiding this because she's making healthier options, but not realising that wasn't actually healthier options. It was going the other way. So you weren't talking about you know, your parents are calorie counting and stuff like that. You just weren't eating as much. So they just thought, oh, she's either not hungry or uh, was it you're hiding it like that? Like you weren't telling your parents, oh, I can't eat that. It, or how was that, you know, sitting down for dinner and your, your mum's cooked you something and you're like, oh, well, I can't eat that mum. Was that, was that sort of stuff happening or was it just you sort of navigating yourself around that? Well, Ed, it became a very internal battle. Yeah. So what I didn't realise was when I started to develop the eating disorder, it also became my control mechanism. So I wouldn't actually voice too much outside. So there would be family dinners or things going on where you would quietly kind of get through. And with eating disorders, they are very intelligent and they kind of affect, um, I guess there is a stereotype that they do affect um, quite, I guess, people that have a little bit of a higher um, IQ or just, um, I guess, in that kind of regards that they can kind of, I don't like to use the word manipulate, but more angle situations that looked like you were appearing okay, but there was a lot of intelligence going into avoiding foods, avoiding conversation and um, basically getting away with something because the eating disorder started to make me feel really good. And I was concerned that if anyone clicked on, that this would get taken away. So um, would you say the relationship with your relationship with food and the eating disorder, it is like you could liken it to an addiction? Absolutely. And, 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 and yeah, and so and like anyone who is addicted to anything, be it drugs or gambling or, <laughs> you know, an addiction with, you know, or eating disorders, I guess. I don't know if that's the right way to say it. But anyone who has an addiction becomes extremely almost cunning and, like, excellent at hiding it. And, you know, whilst they know that, you know, potentially what they're doing is a negative thing, they don't want anyone to know about it. Yes, that very much sums exactly how it is. Um, I guess my experience with anorexia nervosa, uh, nervosa, it was starvation through the body. So you do get to a point where you're messing with your body chemistry. So you're playing around with hormones and things like that, much like a drug reaction where it's not on that normal homeostasis level. It starts to create, I guess, that atmosphere that makes you or gives you that false sense of feeling good. And you run with it because essentially this had stemmed from a moment in my life that I hadn't felt good and all I wanted to do was just go with that that feeling you were feeling. getting. Yeah. And that's what it was providing me at the time. So I know, um, and I know a, a bunch of situations um, where, you know, this age that you're talking about, for anyone, for, for girls, you know, 7 to 14, that is a super sensitive age, right? You're going through all sorts of things, body changing, puberty, growth, you know, hormones, it's all happening, right? And I know, yeah, so many situations where parents are so worried about their kids and the path that they may be lead, heading down, you know, whether whether they're getting bullied at school or, you know, their body type, whether they're athletic or smart or this, that or the other. There's so many issues for parent, but there's a lot of sensitivities around even trying to bring it up or raise these kinds of issues with their kids out of fear of making them feel potentially worse or almost not even knowing how to how to manage the, their children when they're going through these types of things. How was it for your parents? Like, did they understand, you know, what was leading up to your diagnosis at age 14? And did they know how to, you know, manage you or help support you? I'm glad you asked this because I developed an eating disorder at a time where we didn't speak about eating disorders at all. I didn't know anyone with an eating disorder. My parents didn't. And this was probably early 2000s and my first intervention was a school counsellor had to contact my parents to say look something's definitely going on here which everybody knew but as I was saying before I was still very functional so it's hard to intervene with somebody that's still going about their life and still you know doing well at school and keeping up with commitments but they're losing a lot of weight. So the school counsellor contacted my parents and that's when we had my intervention going on there and was sent to the doctor to you know, basically say that there was a diagnosis and we didn't know what to do. And this is no reflection 
on anybody because we've come a long way as a society. We now have conversations. You only have to jump on social media and you can relate to somebody, which I think brings a lot of comfort. However, at this time, we didn't. And that's actually why I went to boarding school thinking, let's remove um, Lex from this situation and maybe if we put her somewhere else, it might change. And that's what we know more about mental health and eating disorders, that just because you've gone somewhere, somewhere else um, doesn't mean that um, the issue isn't it's going better to go now. with yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So, um, but that's, we had to learn that because, yeah. you know, it does make sense. Take someone out of something, but not realising that this is something in the person that they're going to have to work. So... Basically, that's where the eating disorder went into full fledge, and it felt like it was winning from ages fourteen to seventeen when I went to boarding school. It's amazing that um, you know you talk about it sort of in a third person, like it was this other entity that had taken over your body. You know what I mean? Like you sort yeah. of talk. Yeah, it's pretty. It's an interesting way of looking at it. You know what I mean? And it is, and it's. Uh, you can vouch for anybody that has been on the journey with me. I still have some amazing people that have seen me through thick and thin. And they can tell you the girl sitting here right now was not a girl who was laying in a hospital bed a couple of years ago. So that just goes to show the extremity of what overtakes you when you are in the peak and um, peak of an eating disorder and anorexia, which is very misunderstood, I still believe. So it's obviously, yeah, I was going to, it's obviously a very complex issue um, and super sensitive. Um, so it can be hard to talk about, right, for a lot of people who don't, you know, necessarily understand it, and it can be so easy to say the wrong thing. Mm. Um, I suppose. So what did it sound? What did it look like for you once you'd had that diagnosis um, at the age of fourteen? You were saying fourteen to seventeen. What was? What did that period look like? What did that period sort of become? Who Who were you as a person during that? That was very interesting because, as I said, I went up. Is that to when shit school. got real? That's when it got very real and it was basically I was given a chance to really take the eating disorder to the extreme. So as I said, boarding school, 300 girls. I was a prefect. Prefect meant you had your own room. So I was given essentially all this time to be alone and still got through school, still continued with my cross country and um, touch football, but fell well into the peak of an eating disorder. Um, it's unbelievable that you could perform sport without, you know, supplementing your body with everything it needed, you know? Like, how were you, how were you countering those two things? Because you'd think you'd be absolutely stuffed and you wouldn't be able to perform those sorts of, you know, activities. I think that comes hand in hand with a balance of my intensity and also really trying to push the limits. Yeah, okay. And um, it's really quite amazing what you can put the human body through. I mean, I've taken myself to beyond extremities um, to realise the body doesn't really have to function off a lot, but you are being powered a lot mentally by your thoughts and what you can put your th- put yourself through to still keep going. Wow. Yeah, right. So that was going to a new school um, and so you became a prefect. So obviously that's an awesome sign because obviously, I mean, you know, there's uh, an element of leadership, popularity, l- likability, all that sort of stuff. So you've come to a new school and you've, you know. And you're excelling in other areas. Yeah, also. You're, you're, you're obviously, ex- yeah, excelling in, in, in other areas. So what was it like? How was it, how were you received by all the new students and new friends and stuff at the new school? Like obviously they could tell physically that you you know had something going on so was it talked about or well it sort of came in waves I guess when I was 14 we were sent up there and I had periods where I was doing a lot better and um, generally obviously kept it under wraps there until I realized that it wasn't so I kind of slid into that dynamic pretty well and I guess the whole what I was doing at school stemmed from who I thought I had to be as a person. So a lot of this was, I guess, a societal view, I guess, modelling from dynamics that I'd been in before, thinking that you've got to go to school, you've got to be the best at your education, you've got to be the best at sport. And being a very literal person, I would run with that. So I thought that that was exactly who I had to be. That's your perception of success. Exactly. At that point of my life, I thought that that's what brought you happiness. I thought that that's what we do as humans. You know, we're always drained. I 
am from Queensland, we had the QCS. Yeah. And I remember sitting there, even from year nine, going, you have to get the best OP or your life is over. <laughs> and <laughs> Common... Common, um, <laughs> common, common perception, right? This is why true. is it like that? Especially as a literal girl, well, because it's, it's all you know. Funny. Like up until that, yeah, point I know, in your but life, it's so poorly. Like, like it is, teachers it is. say should know better than that. You know, like I mean, I know plenty of people that just did a rank, and they're some of the happiest people I know. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, I actually never got to sit the QCS because I got myself into such a state that I was hospitalised. But I guess, um, yeah. Well, let's get to that point. So um, we're sort of flipping and flopping around all over the place here. So you're at fourteen, uh, then you've gone up to the new school, and then you were prefect. Let's talk about out of school. So uh, losing, like obviously, yeah, prefect. You've got um, set of authority, and you're, you're in charge to a degree of certain things. So coming out of the, the school environment into the real world, how was that transition and, and the eating disorder going with it? Well, I. Didn't actually finish year 12, so at this point it just got too much and the school stepped in and I started my rounds of hospital admissions um, at 16, 17 in year 12. Never went back. So basically when everybody was kind of having those fun moments of school formal, schoolies, which I did get to go to for two days before not working out so well and having to go back to hospital. Another um, story. So got another one <laughs> another there. Another podcast. But... Um, Basically, when you think that that is a moment of your life, you know, remember being 18, going, I have infinite possibilities, I can start uni, I can be anyone that I want. I was essentially in hospital, um, basically learning with this new reality that this is who I was and basically thinking that the end was going to be quite near for me. So I kind of missed out on that whole experience. So talk us through that because um, at that age, I, I would imagine that's a, you've mentioned before that you're being fed on tubes, mm. um, force fed, yes. um, in, yeah, in, in hospitals, which are, you know, can be scary places. Um, can that, be. that must, that must have been super traumatic for oh, you. Definitely. And it's quite funny because with eating disorders, you're very switched on. So all I knew was if I didn't eat, if I exercised a lot, I felt like I was managing my stress. So it essentially made me feel good and I was in control. So my first hospital experience I was put in there and I wasn't aware of any of the symptoms that came with it. I didn't even know what anorexia or an eating disorder was because as Holy I said, shit. Yeah. So I had my first hospital experience and I had to learn about this illness that I had. And so you thought everything was rosy? In many regards because I was still, as I said, functional and still getting by and I couldn't understand why people wanted to stop me in my tracks. That is unbelievable. Mm. That is unbelievable because you'd think... What you're seven, you're seventeen now. This is nearly a ten year process, mm. and you don't realise that there's a problem. No, not at that <laughs> point. But it's like funny. Well, it's not. There's nothing funny, but it's like, um, it's like when people are talking about how you know they're busy, right, in their lives. I'm sick of hearing that. And but like saying, but like busy is like almost an excuse for so many other parts of their lives to fall down. But as long as they're busy at work or whatever, like that's the kind of excuse. You know, everything seems right because I'm, I'm doing everything, you know. I'm flat out. I'm flat out kind of and thing. And exactly that status right. position of going, yeah. wow, that's, let's do that because we forget to address, I guess, some of our health issues that might be going on. But if we keep doing that, then we're busy and that's what we're meant to be doing as a society. So, so let's talk about your hospital admission. What was a turning point? When did you realise you had a problem and then that you were going to change it, you know? Yeah, so long story short, I spent most of my life from 17 to 25 in and out of the revolving hospital door. So during that time, I saw a lot of medical admissions. I saw a lot of time in ICU. I had some rehabilitation programs and not much was really working for me at that time. I'd flown interstate for treatment. My parents are amazing. They just never gave up. So we were always searching for the best treatment option or something that would have to sit with me. And although conventional medicine did save my life, it wasn't exactly what worked for me. So I go back to the theory where we were talking before about chasing a high and chasing a feeling. I learned during that time that you can only do that for so long until you start to come crashing down. The high doesn't quite hit the same highs as it did, you know, once did. Exactly, Dan. So it's Mm. not like you can keep running. And uh, I guess with anorexia for me, it was very results driven. So it was 
had to make this weight to be okay, had to always be working. It's a full-time job when you've got an eating disorder in your head. Like you do not get a break. It's always, I didn't value myself as a person. I had no worth and my whole worth was dependent on having to achieve a score on the scales and in that kind of segment. So it really took over in that regards and um, it comes a time where the highs stop. So all of a sudden I was doing the same thing. I was pushing harder. I was eating less. I was exercising, but it wasn't adding up. Being a literal girl, as I said, my life was A plus B must equal C because that was all I knew before recovery bought me many things. But before that, that's what I thought uh, life was. That was my societal view. And anyway, these highs started stop for, stopping for me, which essentially saved my life. I would try and fight against it. I would still push it to the absolute limit, but I wasn't feeling good. I was sick and tired and I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. <laughs> and it was just to the point you can't get up and do the same thing every day and expect to get a different result, which uh, that's what I was doing. So Definition of insanity. Absolute insanity, but had to push it to that point mm. to realise. Well, you don't, yeah. You don't know until you reach that do. point. Yeah, yeah so, so I had to test it myself. So one of the, the very, um, one of the realities of you know eating disorders like this is they can be fatal in so many you know in so many situations, right? Absolutely. Deadly. Um, in your experience, you know, in and out of hospital, were you coming across you know like other other people in similar situations to you, um, and you know how critical could it have been for you, or how you know how how much pressure was your body under you know how mm. close were you to, to losing your battle uh very close there was a point where I was set up to pass away and family was aware of this I was given roughly around 24 hours to live wow and um, this was a point of 2011 that essentially probably stemmed into my recovery mode of having pushed through that and um, so that was a turning point that was that was turning point number one holy um, shit but it you pushed it to the limit to the limit and there wasn't any worse that uh, you could go at that time and I can't tell you exactly what came over me however there must have been something that goes this is it or you can give yourself another shot and I don't remember because obviously when you're in that position you're not really aware of what mm. is going on in that time yeah. but it was um, if I can say anything it's the eating disorder. There are a lot of skill sets that it gives you to be a fantastic person in many directions. So if you think about this, this is intense. You sh can't just get up every day and starve yourself if you're not driven. You've got determination. You've got something there. You've got all the right elements going on. Yeah. It's just the key you're pushing is not quite the right one. No, and it was going in another direction. Mm. So I think even something that may have saved my life were people telling me when I got that got to that point. I remember people talking about me because I guess that's another stigma with mental illness as well. Um, when you get into those situations where people are talking about you, but you're actually switched on knowing exactly what's going on. Mm. And I remember... It's like I'm right here, like I'm hearing everything you're saying. I'm human too. Yeah. I just think a little bit differently to you. Yeah. And I remember um, doctors going, she's not going to make it. And it was sort of that, that's what it was accepting. But I do remember that something must have triggered in my head of going, I think that man's telling me what to do. No one can tell me what to do. And something happened where I guess... I I guess with personality type, I wanted to prove a point and essentially probably got me onto a track of recovery. Yeah, and I'm doing it because I want to do it. <laughs> I'm not you're doing it. Yeah. Not because you told yeah. me I need exactly. to. Exactly. Yeah, 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 this yeah. is my decision. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so, so what did that road to recovery look like? How did that begin? Uh, recovery was awful. I can say it was probably more awful than the eating disorder. So there is no straight line road with eating disorders. It is up, down, here, there, six steps backwards, one step forward, and the most painful period of my life. But I can say it was a lot shorter than the eating disorder. And I still like to say that I'm in discovery phase. So although I've had these events, I essentially had to step into another life where I'm still discovering all these different aspects that I didn't get to experience as a teenager Um in that regards, but recovery was, as I said, painful, very enduring. And at the time, I just felt like I wasn't getting anywhere. Um, and it was basically, I had to try and find something that was going to 
replace this level of living that I was at. So I couldn't just get up and go, oh, wow, like maybe I should just eat food like everybody else. And if you think about it, eating food is a practice. So I don't have an issue with food, weight and shape at all. I'm a huge foodie. I study food. Like if you talk to me now, I don't know why I would do that in that regards. Like it's such a yeah. joy for me. <laughs> food, is, <laughs> food is delicious. Yeah, it's fantastic stuff. Oh, yeah. But <laughs> it was such a practice. So we don't think about it, that it's just something that as humans you tend to do every single day. But if that hasn't been your normal practice for 15 years, you have no idea what you're doing. So you can't just get up and go, oh, I'll, I'll eat food. It is about as subnormal as, I guess, learning to ride a bike. Like you don't just jump on a bike. You fall off and you try to figure out how to do this. And it was a process of trying to undo a pattern that I'd been well, doing Well, an 18-year 15 years. pattern yeah. to, to totally retrain your line of thinking um, mm. and to get your priorities set. Because you had all, like we said, you had all the other priorities right. It was just that the eating disorder had swayed you in the wrong direction absolutely and I never think and it's um when I work with uh people now when I'm mentoring I like to point that out of going you are not an ineffective person you have the capacity to run a company not everybody can get up and do what you're doing let's turn that around yeah yeah. that's awesome it's awesome in that um in that recovery period what worked for you so this is very interesting I come from a very conventional family so my dad's a doctor my mum's a nurse we did the medical system and then there's Lexi (laughs) then there's Lexi (laughs) you're an only child (laughs) I'm not which is I guess um shout out to my brother for (laughs) I guess sup brother crouch (laughs) yeah brother um, peach (laughs) yeah but just accetting this is my sister I'm sure he was little bit embarrassed by my eccentric nature but everyone's just come to learn to love the person that i am now in the well they've got no choice this is true and we put (laughs) each other through a lot this is me and i guess having the eating disorder as well it doesn't just affect the individual it affects the whole family as well so they went through everything and i'm not one of those people i talk about my family and my mum a lot like i am my mum's biggest fan and we're not one of those people that had that very conventional family we had to really work for that post the eating disorder. So when I started recovery, um, for I believe, as I was saying, a bit like Impact Academy, when things happen in your life and when you really want to do something and you conspire to do it, I think it all aligns. So we met this man and he was into alternative methods. So yoga, acupuncture, just very different things. And I did not want to borrow that as I spoken a lot I was a very literal straight down the line girl Mm. because that's how I thought that I had to be I wasn't open to a world of options or thinking that there might be something outside the box Mm. anyway the uh stars aligned and I met this man and um basically started working with him for years so he had had an experience with drug addiction, which was not too unsimilar to eating disorders. Yeah, wow. Yeah, I'd never been drawn to those uh, substances or elements before. However, very similar. And it was, he kind of gave me a bit, not a bit, he gave me hope that there was life outside of this by his modelling. Yeah, right. So he actually had a daily practice where he was into Tai Chi and he uh, started to talk about yoga maybe being my path and was full blown into exercise addiction and look like if I had time to exercise, it wasn't going to be sitting on a mat to do some yoga. That was a waste of time. And um, basically I worked with him and he put me on my path and yoga became a very fundamental tool to my own recovery here today. So I guess um, the uh, the element of um, discipline, focus, um, concentration, but also being present, like... Your yoga practice kind of gave you a bit of stability. Absolutely. And it was having that commitment because with eating disorders, you're very committed. So I needed to, as I've said with Ed and Dan, um, in that regard, you need to direct that somewhere else. Mm. And as I said, I was so sick and tired that I was willing to try anything. Mm. And if I say openly that if death did not get me, what was my options? I had to actually try and work with myself. I had to figure myself out. Mm. Yeah. And um, basically that's what the yoga provo- provided for me. Yeah, wow. And as I was saying um, earlier on, um, the eating disorder started to relieve stress for me. And I found that this is what yoga was creating. But instead of destroying the body, it was building me up. So that's essentially unreal. what we're talking about here is um, finding um, healthy outlets or healthy coping mechanisms 
just in general for sort of life in general, right? Because that's yes. everyone needs that. Everyone needs like an outlet or a way to let blow off the steam or let the pressure out. So for you, when you were younger, it seemed to be the eating disorder that was that sort of outlet or focus, and then it became a much more healthy option of yeah, yoga and you know physical activity like that. Absolutely, and it was what got me by. So basically, that was just my element that I could keep things in management or keep things in control. So basically, stepping into yoga, it gave me essentially my own world, I guess. Um, so I could have that, but then I could go operate and function um, in society as well because I'd done the work to make myself feel good. I and guess, and yeah. how did the relationship with food evolve, at, like along with the you know with the transition into sort of yoga practice? Like? You didn't just go down to Macca's after you had yeah. your twenty four hours and went down and bought a Big Mac and honed into it. <laughs> no, presume. so it didn't work magic like that. And I openly admit to I didn't just go to a yoga mat, uh, a yoga class one day, sit on the mat and go, oh wow, this is amazing. I remember going in, sitting there for probably thirty seconds, and everyone was quiet, and I'm like, I can't do this. How can people just sit, sit still, still and listen to your own head? Yeah. Next yeah. minute, packed up my mat, I was out the door. So I had a couple of experiences of trying to find the right yoga that worked for me because there are many styles out there and I had to find something that had a little bit more of an edge. Although I was in a depleted state, for me, I had to just go out there and experience my own boundaries. So again, that came hand in hand with health and eating. So I'd get on my mat and you learn so much about your body because you're checking in. I didn't realise when I was in this chemical state of anorexia that I wasn't feeling anything that was going on. So yoga allowed me to stop, to breathe, and basically make that connection with my body and my mind. So it was only three months into it, I started to feel good in my body. So instead of destroying it, it kind of replaced in the sense of going, I want to feel good for yoga. How about I start to eat? And basically started to replace these feelings. And along the way, just started to build up. So I guess slowly with strengths. And it wasn't necessarily a workout. So it wasn't, I wasn't going there for fitness. I wasn't going there to do anything with the body. It just started to make me feel good. And things started to come in slowly. To get I, inside your own head a bit. Exactly. Because that's really cool. what, like you were saying before, you were so busy with everything else. Yes. That you didn't have a chance to stop, think and realise where you actually were at. 100%. So I didn't know who I was. I just had this picture that I had to, I guess, step into society mm. and be this person that society had built up. Yeah, yeah. Unbelievable, it's really. In, it's interesting because, yeah, so that where you go to there, you didn't know who you were. Like that is common for everyone, right, in that, you know, growth period from, you know, as you are talking about, from seven years old to your mid-20s, mm. figuring out who you were. Um there's so many people out there going through that, you know, young women, blo plenty of blokes going through it as well. Um, how do, how do, you know, young girls navigate that? And if you can sort of look back at your younger self, you know, and, and offer any advice, like, what would that be? What would it look like? Yeah, that's really interesting. I actually really enjoy being in my 30s now. I like to call it the awkward 20s during that time where I guess I was scared even going not scared going into 30s but you know we all joke going oh I'm gonna be 30 I'm old but you kind of step into that day when you look oh what a relief I can essentially just be me now what were those weird periods which I feel I don't want to gender type but a lot of girls tend to go through um I guess it does become quite appearance-based for uh, girls and I can maybe guys as well. I can speak from a female yeah. experience. Yeah, definitely guys as well. Like mm. I mean, for sure. Like when um, you know, yeah, it's it's a yeah, super yeah going period for for females. But yeah, guys particularly because you know they're navigating the sense of you know masculinity and what it means to be a you know a bloke and you know it's sort of yeah all going through it as well. Yeah, and it's um I guess to try and change that now is um, when I was growing up, that's how it was. Like it's, we didn't really have that encouraging of going, who are you as a person? Like, how do you use your brain? What do you like? And I had this idea that for me to ever find a boyfriend or something, it had to be purely based on this. And I know that I wasn't the only one going through this. I had friends as well that that's basically, you would lose your whole identity. And it wasn't, we weren't having conversations of sitting down of going, 
what do you like to do? Or mm. I guess, what is it that sparks your passion? I don't think I ever You weren't had finding any out who you were. And, I, like, no, and that's no. and we've had this conversation here. Like after I got back from uh, my honeymoon, I said to Dan, I was like, you know, our focus since we started was all about people having conversations, which is what we want to continue to do, obviously. But mm. need to also focus more on the individual. Yes. You know, it's like some of our biggest fans haven't got the best mental health themselves. You know, like yes. they're more everyone else. Like I'm here to help everyone else. But it's like, no, 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 you've got to look after yourself mm. first. And that's the interesting part is that people are just busy because yes. then they don't have time to sit and think. Yes. You know, if you can't sit down and th- just be there present with yourself, you know, you need to make some changes so you can because it's so imperative, it's like it, as you've learned. It's interesting because these are some of the complexities of the mind, right? Where, you know, being like present and in your own thoughts – can be really scary for a lot of people. And so, yeah, that's the whole thing. And that's what we're trying to get across here. This is not, it's, it's, it's okay to feel those feelings, but you've, you've, we've got to make steps so that you can be positive and sit there and understand who you are and be happy with, because that's the, you hear uh, like the midlife crisis. Mm. I mean, people get to 50 and they've been working, you know, 12 hours a day, put their kids through school, you know, and then they're just like, you know, is this, what do I, I've got to do something now so I can make up for the 30 years that I hated doing, like I hated yes. my job. But if you can figure that out earlier, it's such a huge relief because you're happy with who you are and the journey, it doesn't really matter. You know what I mean? You're just doing what you enjoy doing. And I suppose that's probably where you're at. You know, you had that midlife crisis <laughs> when from you were 20. From the age of seven. Yeah, from, <laughs> yes, well, from yeah. the age of seven. But you have navigated yourself to a position now where you're like, oh, I love who I am. Yes. I'm happy with what I'm doing and I can just go out and do whatever I like because I'm present with you know, myself and, and, and what I want to do. Absolutely. It's kind of funny because it's like, this is the whole thing. It's like, you know, life doesn't stop. It never stops, but it's constant evolution and a constant journey. And like, if, if your seven year old self was told, Oh, he, he, do yoga like there's probably no way you would have well you wouldn't relate to it because it means nothing to you why why do i need to do yoga it's not until you've been through absolutely everything that you've been through been on the you know brink of of death Mm. um and then come out the other side of that and that's that growth phase right i think that's one thing we try to get across is about getting through the shit and like you have got through some of the biggest shit right but it's that growth phase coming out of it where you actually really start to understand yourself and what works and you know how you tick what makes you tick all that sort of Mm. stuff so absolutely and that's I always say um I do a lot of speaking and mentoring and the first thing I will always say to people is the eating disorder is the best thing that ever happened to me and I know that that you know can sound a little bit weird of going wow that sounds torturous but I got to really figure myself out I got to learn how I ticked and During this time, I kept a journal and it wasn't necessarily about my feelings. It was sort of trying to figure myself out as a person. And then I correlated that with the yoga and then coming together. And don't get me wrong, I still have my life challenges. There are many departments. Never stops. That's the other thing is it's not, no one's got it perfect. No. But everyone is getting, like, you need to be getting better, is probably the point. And understanding why I guess I get into situations that I do because you have that awareness now. Yeah. And eventually you get out of them because yep. you go, I wasn't feeling good. Yeah. So that's that's clicked on because as you're saying, you know, people can run, people can still be numb. And I've had this brilliant opportunity to get to figure myself out to that level. And I guess um, it's quite funny because you guys know me, like I'm quite eccentric. I'm quite out there. If I'm happy, I am really happy. And you know, (laughs) if I'm sad, if I'm having a horrible day, it's not unnoticeable because I'll tell you straight how it is. So, and that's quite funny out there in society. We don't have to guess what you're thinking. Exactly. Because that can be funny because in society, they're like, is this chick for real? Like she's literally just told us like, How's your day, Lex? Well, probably didn't need to know about your dating life to that extent, but sorry you asked. And yeah, I guess yeah, that yeah. that's that blessing. Well, you're happy with who you are. Exactly. And that's a credit to you. Yeah. You know, that's, uh, yeah, it's awesome. And I suppose where, where we sort of want to take it now is being a female in 2019, mm. you know, we're talking before when you came in about Instagram and how they've canned the like. Yes. Viewing. You can't see how many people have liked your stuff now. What, what do you make of that and, you know, the, the idea around people with their, with their that might be struggling with body image and have, have probably not understood, like, you know, they've been uh, misinterpreted on social media and, and looking up to other people that they probably shouldn't be? Like, how do, you, how do you navigate through that? 
Yeah, it's interesting. And Instagram and social media in the world of, I guess, um, eating disorders and maybe as somebody that hasn't had the best self-esteem, it really can wreak havoc for people in that regards. I know that um, in my world, in the eating disorder world, it is taken to the extremities. And as we were talking about before, um, because you don't you're not in a chapter where you can find that in yourself. You can't find your own self-worth. So where there's Instagram out there with the likes where you're getting that validation. So that was pretty much seen as these dopamine hits for people that kind of needed to get by while you're figuring yourself out as a person. So taking them away I think is a fantastic idea because you've got to think about is this something I want to post for me? Is this something that truly represents the person I am rather than am I doing this for validation or should I put this picture on there because I know that it's going to get a lot of likes and it basically makes you step back a little bit and I guess go into that human aspect and go, look, I'm only going to post this for me because we can't see that likes and we're not going to compare, which is a big thing with body dysmorphia, body image issues, eating disorders, where you can go into comparison because you're not feeling good about yourself and you know, you're, you, you are your own worst critic in an eating disorder that you kind of think that you just want to fit in with everybody else. So you can see how validation plays a huge role with social media there. Yeah. Um, uh, well, what I'm particularly interested in is, um, yes, like social media is a fantastic tool. It's given, you know, people a platform to express themselves and, you know, run businesses and all sorts of things. I think it's fantastic. I mean, but, you know thing's greatest strength is also its greatest weakness so Mm. it's you know got the two sides of the coin there what about i mean there's probably so many people out there who don't even engage or don't aren't active on social media as in posting right but there's lots of people absorbing social media and lots of lots of people watching from a, a distance and who aren't posting you know their own stuff but they're really absorbing you know this these glamorous lifestyles and no one ever you know, puts anything negative up, right? Yes. It's all, yeah, it's all the best version of, you know, your life and so great. But there's so many people absorbing this. Young blokes, um, young girls looking up to, you know, these perfect, you know, suit models and, you know, swimsuit models and all this sort of stuff. And, and I guess getting this perception of, you know, this is what success looks like or mm. this is what beauty needs to be or, you know, all that sort of stuff. What what role do you think that plays for young, impressionable, you know, boys and girls? And, yeah, it is absolutely huge. And I know for myself I try to keep my page as honest as possible because I don't enjoy that side that is not maintainable. And I guess when we say try, you're always going to have this perception on the internet and people are going to look at you in a different way and what is betrayed might be differently said. But when it comes to, I guess, a lot of these influences, you've got to step back and exactly what you said, Dan, that this is just a snippet of their day of what's going on. We don't know what's going on and people don't always want to air their dirty laundry on Instagram. Yes, like that, you know, you do catch snippets of going, I've been struggling and you know, doing these things, but you tend to see these glossy sides and people think that's real. And I know from firsthand experience, I've met people off the internet and they haven't matched up to the pictures at all in this regards um, because they have been so photoshopped. And, you know, I'm speaking for myself as well. Like I do a bit on Instagram, so I hope that it kind of projects that. But it also really takes away from, I guess, the person because you do lose yourself because it kind of thumbs into this is what we've put out there to make people think that this is real and particularly with eating disorders as I said it was very literal people will run with that and think that this is how it's meant to be because these people are getting all these likes that they must have a very happy life but we don't know that because we don't see what's going on it can be very misinformative and um, working in the space that I do um, I hear day in day out of people comparing themselves to what they've seen on the internet and going back to, you've just caught a snippet, you've caught a good filter. And don't get me wrong, I'm the first to put something glossy over a picture as well to make it a little bit more attractive in that regards. But people just don't understand that sometimes that's not addressing the human element or what is actually going on for Mm. a person. Mm. It's we need to keep having these conversations. Uh, Yeah, Yeah. um, that's super interesting. I wanted to um, touch on 
quickly, and you may not know much about this, Ed. I, David Pocock, mm. rugby player. You're aware. Churchy Big boy. Family. Churchy yeah. boy. <laughs> Played with Rupert. <laughs> yeah. Churchy boy, yeah. <laughs> no, no, I mean, I know you know who he is, but he, um, I believe he went through some oh, body he was on. Oh, uh, it was on Australian Story not long ago. Uh, a couple of years ago. Not yeah. Long ago, a couple of years ago. So about, this, is, yeah, it, this, this is an Australian rugby player, yeah. Wallaby, a flanker. Mm. And Wallaby. this is when he was at school. For the Wallabies. This is grade like 11 and 12. His dad would wake up in the middle of the night to go to the bathroom and he'd hear David in there doing sit-ups and push-ups in his room at like midnight. Yes. So I gonna I think that's lo- like body dysmorphia, mm-hmm. right? In in for his, you know, in in his experience, but we think about we talk about, you know, eating disorders and body dysmorphia and all that sort of stuff. And I think it can be so easily only related to females. Mm. It's like I think a lot of people or blokes out there think, Oh, that's probably just a that's female just a chick thing. thing, yeah. But it also exists in terms of, you know, weight gain and bodybuilding and yes. you know muscles and and you know we see you know on the opposite end of the spectrum blokes who are obsessed with you know their bodies and body image but on the in the opposite of gaining muscle and gaining weight and looking like an adonis yes and yeah i think david pocock was in one of those situations there as well where and he was uh, i've heard that at a point in time he was told to stop doing weights Training because he he was getting too. Yeah, I was trying to think. He was getting um, too big. Yeah, I was only thinking about it the other day when I went to school because the uh, yeah that David and Rupert and all that finished in two thousand five and I went to boarding school in two thousand six, and then there were stories you know of like I'm just trying to remember it was like, it was like three or four percent body fat David mm-hmm. Pocock had which is like ridiculous like. Yes. The best bodybuilders in the world have like six or seven percent body fat, you know. And uh, there were stories of him; he'd come to board as breakfast and eat like twenty six bo- hard boiled eggs. You know what I mean? Like, yes. just insane. <laughs> like, and but he was, yeah, like like you said, he he was in this in this way of um, yeah, body dysmorphia and was trying to but so fit this yeah Adonis yes. But so belief. then it's a very it's a very it's tent like you know fine line here because. It's almost like if you look at the opposite end of the spectrum, we talk about health and fitness and, and all that sort of stuff, where well you would assume that, you know, hitting the gym and lifting weights is a really good outlet, and, and which it is. and you know, It's really everything in way. moderation. Mm. That's the Definitely. point we need to try and get across. It's everything in moderation. Like if you're spending eight hours a day at the gym and working, and yes. <laughs> you know, that's probably not healthy. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm just saying, oh, no, yeah, as, yeah, a, yeah. as a number, I don't know, yeah. whatever. But, so, but, but I think the point here is that this is not something, you know, that it comes in so many different types and yeah. can affect so many different people in so many different ways, you know. And, um, and I think that's why, as you say, Lexi, it's such a complex yes. issue because it comes in so many forms and... Yeah, it's not just a one package deal. This is what that is. Yeah, yes. it's like it could be any of this. Exactly, and I guess um, even in sports, it does go under the radar because we accept that as a society of going, oh, but they're an athlete, so it must be for sports per se. Like we see about shredding, like that's not healthy in regards, like shredding yes, for stereo. <laughs> 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 I guess, Stereo. I guess like with the starvation that goes with that. And we kind of need to take a look of going, is that maintainable? Is that something mm-hmm. that is really making you happy and healthy because you're messing with your body chemistry and I guess going that aim. But it also goes back to, I guess, upholding that figure that I guess with um, these athletes that they have to, I guess, portray. And it goes hand in hand. And again, as you said, um, the complexity of that is – for males, it tends to be the other way. Again, not gender typing, but it's about being bigger, which is, you know, an issue as itself, whereas sometimes with females and males, it can be about being slender the other way. So it's that whole range that addresses yeah, it with issues it, going it, on. Yeah, definitely. And then, like, I think of some of the, like, uh, NRL identities over the years, like Piggy Riddell, like that guy, you know, Never looked like an athlete. Let's you get know Piggy Riddell on Let's the podcast. Get Piggy Riddell on the <laughs> or like Georgie Rose, right? Like yeah. those guys were big dudes, yeah. you big know? Bodies. They big were just bodies. big. Like they were not shredded, you know, like you think about now, like the props of, you know, 2019, like the Burgess twins or like, uh, you know, Marty Tapao. You know, these guys are just like eight pack shredded, not a, you know. And then you look at those guys. Mm. But people... Um, who, yeah. was the, who was the... Uh, the um, Matt Dunning, <laughs> Matt, yeah. Dunning. Yeah. Matt Dunning, yeah. Matt Dunning, Matt Dunning, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like these guys, yeah. But that's it, it and you don't, um, 
yeah, probably people don't put them into the – like forget about them to a degree. Yeah. Um, that like, yeah, they were great sportsmen as well, but they didn't look like, you know, uh, a ripped Adonis person and they were successful mm. footballers. Exactly. You know, so like it's, it's funny that people sort of forget that. Um, yeah, you don't have to – yeah, look like the, but I think, but, the but, best but bloke in the gym to be what successful. I, what exactly. I feel like it sort of comes down to is um, is finding a way to. I mean, wh- who are you? Who are you changing yourself for? Like, who are you trying to appease? Who are you trying to prove yourself to? Mm. And why? You know, and is it about you know everyone else's perception of you, or is it uh, is it about your own perception of yourself? And then how how can you find a way to be happy in your own skin? Um, and comfortable with who you are, you know, without trying to to be this person that you think you need to be. Exactly. Yeah, I relate to that very well in that regards. It is essentially finding that in yourself, which is a journey. I mean... It doesn't just happen overnight, does it? Yeah. And I can't sit here and practice and go, I've found that in myself. I'm still working on elements in my life of going, Lex, is that, you know, because you want to do that for you or is that because that's another societal view? It's never complete. It never ends, yeah. It's never complete. Yeah, yes. I think that's that's another misconception is people are like, oh, well, they've got it all worked out. Well, it's like, no, no one's really, no one's got it worked out, you know? And like, it's scary the ones that say that they do. That's <laughs> where you've got to step in and go, whoa. Whoa, easy. Yeah. Easy, Tiger. <laughs> yeah. yeah, definitely. If definitely. I can, I want to um, flick um, to um, your study. Yes. Which is really cool. Um, health, health science and nutrition. Yes. So Who'd have thunk it? Yeah, well, you know, who knew that you could actually get a degree out of this food study? But yes, on the home stretch now. So I'm four subjects away and in clinic treating patients at the moment. So now get to work with the individual, basically talking about how food can work with you, not against Against you, you. which is my whole overview of health and basically feeling good. So I kind of stepped into that avenue and it's been a journey for me. I'm not a conventional person at all. So it wasn't about getting better and going to university. I've seen a lot of life that's in the be- this degree. That's the best thing about you. Yeah, you're yeah. not conventional. No, and I wouldn't change a thing. I mean, during Neither this would degree... I. Don't change, Lex. <laughs> <No. laughs> it's been fun and it's always been that little tedious. I think I've lived in India. I've had a baby. I've had a lot of life in between this degree, but almost finished. And, um, yeah, looking forward to getting out there and really working one-on-one with clients. And I guess having that little twist as opposed to this is what a book said, mm. but this is what this I've how been I lived through. It. Yeah. yeah. And that's the other thing you've been out, you're able to validate that. Mm. That's, um, I mean, that's so important. But you know, what I love is like that you spent the best part of 20 years. I think if my maths is right, 18 years, maybe um, going through basically going to hell and back, being on the brink of death, um, everything that you've been through, coming out the other side, the growth phase, and now through that lived experience, you're able to use everything you've learned and your experience and your relatability and your personality to try to help other people who are going through similar things. Mm. And it's like, I I just find that so cool because if you hadn't been through any of that, you might be counting beans in some corporate office somewhere or who knows, you know what I mean? Exactly. And it's like... If this wasn't your kind of path almost or like it's sort of evolved the way it was supposed to for you. Just Dan Allen or Tony Robbins in the <laughs> building. But don't you reckon that's cool? Yeah, it's unreal. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I know, like, that's why we're all here. Exciting. I love we're it. all here yeah. for the same reason. <laughs> yeah. it's, uh, Get a no. real job, kids. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's uh, talk about, yeah, what you're doing now. You're finishing uni and you're an advocate for the... Ambassador, uh, ambassador, for the butterfly foundation. Yes, yeah, I do a lot of speaking for them. So essentially, a speaker, but also for eating disorders, Queensland as well. I do mentoring for them and um, get to go and educate. So a lot of professionals are now asking how best can we work with eating disorders, and you know, I guess the proof is in the pudding that they're asking for lived experience to go. What did you do? Because it can be quite an enigma to see somebody so unwell and then see don't want to toot my own horn, but, you know, Stop pinnacle tooting. of health. <laughs> you know, like, right, vibrant girl, obviously got so much energy in this regards. What is it that you were doing that um, yeah. you can help us, uh, I guess, be the best professionals that we can be to it, help yeah. others? And then it Definitely. starts to really analyse and break down personality types and, like, your own personality type and how that contributed to everything that you've been through, right? Yeah, absolutely. So, 
yeah, I guess it stems from being that fun thing of essentially I still get to be me and not fit that corporate kind of mould. I mean, I always say to people, don't employ me. Like, I'll try and give you unsolicited advice in that <laughs> regard. So. I need a job, but do not yeah. employ me. <laughs> yeah. What um, can um, w- Run us through the Butterfly Foundation. What exactly is the Butterfly Foundation? So the Butterfly Foundation is the national, I guess, um, eating disorder and body image head through Australia. So they have support uh, hotlines um, that if you are going through issues that they have someone that you can pick up the phone and have conversations with that will help you through because the ins and outs of eating disorders, they are not easy. There are some moments that the eating disorder can just strike you and might just save your life just having that conversation. So they've got that going. They've got support groups and basically they've got an appearance that keeps everyone connected as well as providing education and resources. They go out to schools and again, like not giving stigma airtime. Like that is pretty much like say goodbye to that. They basically will just talk about eating disorders and get this open. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I love awesome. that you say that because we're all about eradicating the word stigma. Don't say that word. Yeah. <laughs> the S word. Stigma the S word. Um, and so there's support for um, both sufferers um, of uh, eating disorders and also their support um, network. So say your for your family, for instance, and, you know, the support network around people who are going through this, it's there for them as well. Yeah, and they will always give you resources and direction of where you can get help because essentially they are, I guess, the um, national collective where awesome. we can outsource that. Yeah, that's great. Um, and so, but like what I think is a massive takeaway here is that you can get through it. You can actually beat these disorders because you're living proof. You've been right to the edge and you've come full circle. A hundred percent. And um, if I had been out there and heard of somebody who recovered, I would have thought it was absolute rubbish. I would have gone, oh, well, good for them getting their life together. They must have been as bad as me. Yeah, Mm. no no one knows how I felt. And I can say I was that girl. The amount of times that, you know, I'd sit there and go, this is so misunderstood, no one ever thought to the level. And I just want to voice that I have been that person and it is there. And it is a journey. It was, as I said, recovery was the hardest thing that I ever did. And I'm still growing in that regards. But... It is possible. And even like 10 years ago, I would have sat down and gone, it is not possible. Like we were arranging for a funeral 10 years ago. So it is that, I guess, that spark that, you know, if I can do it, you can do it. Yeah. So sort of a a message to everyone that's out there listening, people that may be, you know, suffering a bit or know of someone that may be suffering, what would you say, say to them? I would say um, try and reach out as best as you can firstly. Get a conversation going and try and find some people. You will find people in your life that are in that level that are willing to sit there and listen. So the first thing I think is just kind of checking in with yourself and going, is this okay? And basically trying to let somebody know is a very first step because you're holding a lot there and you do think that you've got it under control. But you actually don't when it eventually comes crashing down. So if people are out there struggling, it's try and find somebody that you trust and basically good people will be there and help you in that regards. And I guess um, staying connected in that regards has been a huge element and um, basically just keep going. You know, it's we can put a lot of, I guess, focus on having one really bad day but knowing that the next day could be completely different and it's just you're doing the best that you can at that time and sometimes there are periods that just feel so horrible for so long but just keep going through them and the answers keep coming and I know that that can sound pretty rich from somebody that is sitting here living like I guess a pretty cool life with the ups and downs and the journey there but there have been periods where it didn't feel good and the best thing I did was not give up even when I thought that that was that was probably the best option. Awesome. That's incredible. Well, um, it sort of just about uh, rounds us out a bit. Have you got anything? I, I want to um, I just um, – you've got – we were talking outside privately about some exciting things that you've got coming up that we can't quite say yet, but, you know, some super cool things in store for you in your work as an advocate. You know, you're coming to the end of your university degree. Um, 
people can, out there can sort of follow your journey or anyone who, who wants to know more about you, um, I guess Instagram, you've got a bit of a website as well, right? Yeah, got those little things happening where I try to just keep engaged with, I like to give um, insights of daily life. So I guess a lot of um, the people that follow me have experienced issues with eating disorders where life is a hospital and it's pretty dark. So you might see me outside going, yeah, the sun's shining today and yes, I am an excitable person because I didn't always get to see the sun or someone will walk in and be like, it's a butterfly, it's a butterfly. <laughs> so I try to give these glimpses on my Instagram that sometimes probably look like that kind of like, well, she's pretty intense, but I just value the... Um, every day. The every day, but you will see the ups, ups and downs. Like, you know, you'll see me there being like, yeah, today really wasn't cool and that kind of regards or, you know, just backed my car into a pole. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks, Mercury Retrograde, strike 16. But just try to keep it real in that regard. So, yeah, there's Instagram I try to connect. And uh, Lexi, yeah. at Lexi Crouch. Lexi.crouch. Le- Lexi. And Lexi. feel Crouch. free to DM. I am only a DM away and I literally put it to myself that I do get back to you. Might not be tomorrow, might be in a couple of weeks, and but uh, I will awesome. reach out. And awesome. for anyone who might be sort of struggling now, this might strike a chord with maybe um, direct them to the Butterfly Foundation. Definitely. Um, so check out that website. There yep. And websites and resources. And if you're in Brisbane, Queensland, Eating Disorders Queensland, has some great programs and mentoring as well. If you do need somebody to just, I guess, walk beside you while you're going for a journey, I personally mentor, so I'm there. We might be matched, but there are a lot of resources um, from those places. Fantastic. Awesome. Well, you're an absolute picture of health, and it's been fantastic to have you in here. You're an absolute Thanks, legend. Peach. Thanks, Thanks, We buddy love always you. Always love chatting. Love you guys <laughs> Good too. chat. Um, so, yeah, um, thanks very much for coming in. Thanks, guys. Thanks, mate. Yay.